What's going on, everyone? Welcome to another episode of the EPM Show. This is all things enterprise performance management, and we are here to give you an unfair career advantage. Today's episode is a treat. We had Matthew Dickerson on the show. He leads the Anaplan COE at Jaguar Land Rover. Came to us all the way from the UK, and man, I am impressed with his leadership and what they've been doing over there at JLR. One of the things we talked about is how the Anaplan COE has helped Jaguar Land Rover in a really pivotal time in the automotive industry. As many of you might know, there's a global semiconductor shortage and the Anaplan COE has played a critical role in helping the company shift from being demand-led to supply-led as a result of that shortage. And that dovetailed us into a really good conversation around why it's important to know your industry if you're working at a customer. You can't just know Anaplan, but you have to constantly be pursuing an understanding of your industry. And then we talked about JLR's keys to success for their organic growth. Guys, they've grown from 150 users to over 1,500 users, and none of that has been pushed or mandated. He talks about how their first Anaplan implementation was on time and under budget and the keys to success with that project. And he had some great insights around what's next for the COE at JLR and why curiosity is the greatest career hack for EPM professionals. I hope you guys enjoy this episode. Check it out. Matt, give the audience your career flyover in 60 seconds. Morning, everyone. My name is Matthew Dixon, born and raised in Birmingham in the United Kingdom. I am married with two kids, two lovely little girls, and uh, really... In- Really enjoy playing rugby, um, which is one of the things I'm very passionate about. Um, I say playing, more watching nowadays, but throughout my younger days, very much enjoy playing rugby union. One of the things I'm really passionate about is is sport, but also the accuracy, both in a personal and, and a work perspective. I guess leads me on to in my career now. So I started off after university going into recruitment, which I must say I wasn't very good at, but went into then develop from there to go into more business development focused around IT and software. I spent a couple of years at different companies, uh, mainly as a, a side consultancy, working through that before finding my feet in a company called Steel Wedge that were a sales and operations planning company focused on that. US based and spent three years there building a pipeline for them before moving into the professional services side, which was my first introduction to Jaguar Land Rover. I worked there for a year as a consultant before working for other companies and then I had an opportunity to come internally at Jaguar Land Rover. That was back in 2017. And then it's been a nice seven-year journey through technology and planning within JLR to get to today, where I'm now the head of the Anaplan Center of Excellence at JLR. Absolutely crushed it. And you actually stole my second question, which was going to be, what is one of your favorite hobbies outside of work? But it is clearly watching rugby. So my my follow-up question to that, is what is your favorite memory in rugby? I'll I'll give you both. I mean, I was lucky enough when I was uh, 16 to get to play for the national team. So I played for England when I was 16, uh, played games against Portugal and Wales. We beat Portugal, but unfortunately lost to to Wales, which was disappointing. But standing there singing the national anthem will, will never go away. I guess from a watch perspective, it was being sat in my parents' house at the age of 20, watching England win the the Rugby World Cup against Australia. Probably one of the most tense days watching it go to extra time and all that. So yeah, those are definitely two of the big memories I have from that sport, which is why I'm very passionate about it. That is so cool. I actually got to go to South Africa several years ago and met several rugby players. That was my first exposure to rugby. Let me tell you, it is an intense intense sport i I can't imagine the feeling of getting to hear your national anthem play and competing for your country that is a very very rare very cool experience where all did you get to go when you were playing internationally so we only had a a few games at that stage so i mainly just stayed in the uk we had teams come to us rather than go elsewhere i know that since i've done that they do have tours elsewhere and and they've developed it into a more of a aligned to things like the Six Nations but at my time we were mainly staying in the UK for three weeks and, and playing a couple of games so yeah I mean we'd love to have gone on tour and other bits but not not quite I mean we did tour at school when we went to Ireland which was a great experience spending a week and a half there but not so much with the international piece. Matt I know 
you're obviously leading the Anaplan COE at JLR and recently participated in the Anaplan Connect back in July. And I know that one of the key themes that came out of that, that you're really focused on right now within the JLR COE is leading with confidence through change. Can you talk about what that looks like for you and your position and just kind of the environment that you're in right now when it comes to leading through change? Yeah, I, I think a lot of organizations are finding at the moment change is paramount in the industry and, and automotive is no, is no different there. I think even more so you've seen the impact of the likes of COVID and lockdown from semiconductors and the shortage there. So we've had to pivot for the last few years to understand instead of being demand led, we're supply led from an automotive perspective, being able to make sure we get that. The, the best thing for the company is it making sure that we can satisfy our customers demand are we still able to be profitable as an organization and that's really made meant that we've been able we've had to plan differently and i bring us forward to today where we've got a more stable view on our semiconductors but now what cars do people want do we want to stay with the the powerhouses of petrol and diesel are we going towards hybrid are we also looking at some of the ev cars that we're building these are all the things that we need to take into account we need to scenario and then be able to make a, an informed decision, I guess, at the end of it. And that's definitely with some of the things we're really trying to drive through our planning and our plan. One of the things that's coming out to me right now is just how plugged in you are to the industry and the pain points of the industry. Can you talk about the importance of really knowing your industry and understanding the headwinds? It's not just about building a model, right? That's one thing. But knowing why you're building a model and how Anaplan fits into the ability of JLR to navigate change. I mean, to me, it's huge. It's one of the things that I have mentioned with my team is making sure you fully understand where you're going into and the areas we're looking to develop. Because with that extra understanding of the business, you, it makes it much easier when developing a tool set, especially within Anaplan. You've seen it where if you don't have the right stakeholder engagement, you don't have the right knowledge, you can you can build the best model. But if you've not got the requirements right from a customer perspective or you haven't fully understood what you're wanting to get out of it that that's a huge piece that can be missing from these uh, developments so it, it is really important to understand that and i guess on top of that not just understanding the business area but understanding the process so we talk of sales and operations planning or sales and operations execution understanding the best practice there as well so as well as getting the subject matter experts from those uh, areas you can also drive a, a conversation. Well, I know you, that's how you do it now. Have you thought of doing it this way? And then it becomes very much a collaborative approach to development. What are some of the things that you and the team are doing on a consistent basis to make sure that you're plugged in to the industry? And how have you seen that help drive the Anaplan roadmap forward in the organization. I must say the JLR are very good at sharing industry knowledge. We make sure on a sort of weekly, fortnightly basis that we have touch points on the changes that we can see currently. So that's one of the ways we keep ourselves educated. From a the business areas perspective, we make sure we have fortnightly catch ups with them. We make sure that we're driving the best approach for how we do developments with them. So as well as having the industry knowledge, we make sure that we have that knowledge of those particular business areas, understanding that what's coming up. And then we also make sure we try and attend as many of the Anaplan development events as well. So going to the Anaplan Connect event you mentioned in, in London last month was great, seeing some of the new developments there and then being able to link that into what we're doing as a business. So things like Polaris, the geo mapping all sound really interesting and actually can have a real benefit within an organization. And that's for us to go and discuss with our internal stakeholders and make sure they know that options are available. This is a career takeaway to me. It's not just about doing your job, but it's actually about engaging, engage in the company, engage at JLR of what's going on. What are we navigating? Semiconductor shortages, right? You talk about that. But then if you're in the Anaplan COE, it's in, engage in the Anaplan ecosystem, attend the connects, right? Get involved, kind of go that extra mile. So you, you were at the Anaplan Connect. I think you had the opportunity to speak at the Anaplan Connect in July. Can you tell me a little bit about that? So for Anaplan Connect, one of the big themes from Anaplan was obviously leading with confidence. And, and we definitely bought into that from our developments with Anaplan. We talked through our roadmap. So starting Anaplan, contract was signed end of 2018. We started small with sort of demanded supply balancing, then grew out into some other areas around compliance. So this is the focus on 
taxation for our vehicles. We've got some actually brilliant cars. When you look at like a five liter diesel engine, but the, the emissions there and depending on the taxation and fines you can get from the different markets, how do we mitigate this? How do we work with that to make sure we become compliant? And then watching it grow over the last four years. So taking on more ownership on the supply planning side, going into our pricing area, HR, looking at some of the KPI performance pieces we've got there. So really gone from a user base of about 150 and now touching over 1500 users in, in four years, which has been a great development. So we covered that story, but really showing how we've broken down some of the barriers we've had before. So sometimes we can act plan siloed. How do we bring things together? That real connected piece that I feel Anaplan do so well. So making sure we can share data in a timely fashion, communicate that with stakeholders and just give them the assurance that the data they're using is right. Anytime you're in a big organization, you're going to have silos, right? I've worked in a big corporate, 10,000 people or more international company, and we were, we were very siloed. I think every company of, of substantial size deals with that. Can you share some stories or testimonies of how the Anaplan journey at JLR has, has actually been able to remove silos? Yeah. I mean. I like to think of a project in in three ways. I mean, I probably had one, one extra, but I'll come to that. So people, process, and then the technology to support it. I think it's, it's what you know. And I'd also throw data in there as well, because that is always a big piece for when you're looking to do sort of connected planning. And one of the things which we did really well with our first implementation was making sure we had the right setup as a team. So we had different work streams. We had our subject matter experts as one area for demand planning. We had our Anaplan model builders, which was a mix of internal and external. We had our change management team that were communicating with the 150 users. So they knew as they went through the step change, what was happening, creating vlogs and making sure that was available to them. The other three work streams we had were the IT or digital teams to make sure we were sourcing data correctly. We have, as a company that's had a numerous uh, owners over the last 20 years, we have disparate systems and we need to have the right reference architecture to make sure we've got good information into our Anaplan system. So they were very important on how we made some big improvements within JLR as part of our Anaplan development. And the other last two were our reporting area. So a lot of people report on the volumes we do. So how did we get that data available to the wider business? And then our exec teams, these were our exec sponsors, making sure that we were on track and uh, obviously driving it forward at an exact level. So having that set up made sure that we were able to deliver well. And I think things like that have l led on. So make sure, making sure we had the right reference architecture was huge. So all data now goes through our enterprise data warehouse and is then fed into Anaplan. So we know we've got one source there. Then making sure that we are bringing together the right data sets. Then I. In the past, we've seen data being shared within departments, different, different words meaning the same things for like a derivative, let's say, and there's lots of manual mapping, Excel's thrown around. We just wanted to remove that, that bit of uh, extra work from people. So being able to define that and remove that has just meant more cost savings and, and time savings for people. So you move away from manipulation of data to a planning and scenarioing position. The phrase buy-in comes to mind for me, buy-in across every, every lane. And two that I hear that are important, especially they're all important Two that I can imagine can make differences that maybe are less technical or number one executive sponsorship is it's got to come from top down saying, this is our priority. We're going to invest not just money and resources, but we're going to invest time and we're going to put our talent on this project too. And then the second piece was the change management piece that we haven't really talked about as much on this show. Can you talk about maybe what the executive sponsors did to help make this so effective? And then to what the change management team did and how that played a role in standing up your first kind of successful implementation. Cause I also imagine that that first one set the tone for the ones that were to come, right. And kind of started off with started off right. You did it right at the beginning. You went all in and then it, it set the tone and laid a foundation for, for the rest of the roadmap. Is that fair? Yeah, definitely. I'm, I'm very proud of that first implementation and mainly because the feedback we got was 
the project was on on time to, to budget and these are things that sometimes people take for granted when you put together a plan and things slip so the fact that we managed to deliver the project a month and a half before we had a drop dead date it was replacing a legacy system if we didn't hit that drop debt drop dead date we would be paying more money to the the incumbent and we did that ran it in parallel they went live so it it was delivered really well and our exec monitors were brilliant they pushed us when we needed to be pushed they were also behind us when we needed backing so there was a need to understand we we lost a resource within our data area so that was fundamental to part of our testing we needed to make sure we had the right data so they were able to push the right areas to backfill and bring that through so really supported us as we were developing and growing our uh, implementation the change management area was also huge getting the development done at the start they weren't needed but as soon as we were engaging people bringing them into those discussions and making sure that the user stories they'd initially given us were were in line was great then it was a i think we had weekly vlogs so little videos to catch people up as well as sharing them on you know our internal sites as well then to training, making sure that we, for like our European users, we went out there and spent three days with them. We did something similar for our overseas area and North America region. We didn't do it for China. I think we wanted to do it remote and then making sure we covered out Europe. So very much making sure you have touch points with everyone. And they were also hugely uh, important after go live as well, because I think sometimes that's forgotten. You've got to have the right support in place, but also with Anaplan, being able to give them updates saying, we've heard you. We heard the issues that you found. This is what we're doing to fix it. And that made the whole delivery of this initial project really uh, successful for me. Don't you love it when a plan comes together? (laughs) (laughs) We do a lot of leadership development work with companies. And we talk about this idea of the support challenge matrix. And the idea behind the support challenge matrix essentially is you want to be up and to the right. So think of four quadrants. And the ideal environment that you're wanting to create is one of high challenge and high support because it leads to an empowered culture. And that's just kind of what I hear you highlighting and describing there is you had the right amount of challenge, you had a drop dead date that you had to push for, but then you have the resources and the support behind you to actually get it done. So was it comfortable at all times? No, I'm I'm sure it wasn't. But I do want to circle this back to the confidence piece. Hmm. Tell me a little bit about how you're leading with confidence in your COE right now and just how all this comes together to help, you know, create an environment where like, hey, you know, there's change, there's ambiguity, but we're confident that we have what it takes to be able to navigate that change. It's a big thing, as I've uh, mentioned, obviously leading a uh, Anaplan COE within JLR, been up and live now for just over two months, and we are making sure that we are continuing to support the areas that use Anaplan, but also looking at where do we go next. So we we have grown, as I said, from 150 users to over 1,500, and none of that's been pushed. That's all been organic growth from people hearing about the projects we've done and the developments we've uh, achieved and some of the, the ROI, which is great. But now, strategically, where are we looking to grow? Can we prove to them that actually this is an area we need to go into? just by highlighting the successes we do. So we've probably on a weekly basis now, I speak to one or two different business areas, highlighting what we've delivered so far, discussing the data we've got in there, and even just putting together a couple of simple proof of concepts for people to see what we've done. And I really try and empower my team, not just myself, to go and speak confidently with business areas. It's it's not about me as the head of CUE, it's about all of us, because we've got to all show that same confidence in what we're doing. And I must say I'm very lucky I've got a very capable team that are able to have good conversations with other business areas. That's great. Out of curiosity, what is one proof of concept that you've done or one business area that you're just super excited about that you think, man, if we can if we can build something here, this is going to be super high impact? I mean, one of the ones which we're actually looking at at the moment is the Polaris sparsity model, which we're looking at for our pricing area. So We've had a lot of developments with pricing during the during our talk. Kara and my colleague talked about how they built something as they started adding on more data. It's kind of didn't work as well. Anapan were brilliant along with Bedford Consulting, who were the consulting partner on that to help rebuild it. And we've got to a really good position now with what we're doing from a pricing perspective. The next steps there are going, what else can we do? Can we start taking the level of granularity down to a 
um, a lower level. And that's where the current models were limited in that, with, you know, you get to a sparse level of data, you know, millions upon billions of data points, which really do fill up an Anaplan model. But when you start looking at that lower level of granularity and we're just having a play at the moment within the Polaris model, it, it has the potential to really start giving us some valuable information from a pricing perspective. So that one is the one that's really sort of exciting me at the moment that we're looking at. That's awesome. That's awesome. I'm going to get you out of here on this. Two questions. The okay. first question is, what advice would you have for an EPM professional who's earlier in their career? So early in your career, I would want to know as much as you can. The thing that's always driven me is, is asking the questions of how things work. Don't sit back there and, and be silent in meetings. Be, don't be afraid to ask those questions. And also diving into the data, the amount of days I used to spend with old systems sitting there transforming data, understanding it late into a night because it has given me the fundamental understandings of an organization is their data. So that to me is is the the big one, making sure you um, dive in there. I guess, I guess, yeah. It makes me think about one of a, a good friend of ours that we've had on the show, Ryan DeBeal, talks about pathological curiosity. And that's so much of it, just asking the questions in the meeting, diving into the data, seeking to understand it, drawing out those insights. That's great. The second question that I have for you is you're, you're leading an Anaplan COE. I think you mentioned you want to go from three resources to 10, uh, a lot of exciting things happening at JLR, but what is your next BHAG, your next big, hairy, audacious goal? It doesn't have to be work-related. It can be if you've got something that you're going after, but you could run a marathon, get a PhD, whatever, just what, what's kind of the next big goal for you that you're running after? Yeah, I'll, I'll leave work to one side. I think two months into a COE job, there's a lot for me to do there. But from a personal perspective, I, I've i obviously mentioned I've, I've loved rugby, really enjoyed that, but I've also been very into my fitness. So one of the challenges that I have set myself, but not achieved, been for years now, is around on the rowing machine and ergo. The, the challenge is always, you know, you get under seven minutes and you fit. So I've been doing that, but the one I want to get for is that sub 640 row on uh, on an ergo which is a, a 140 pace i've never got there i've been sort of three seconds off so that's the aim for me i mean people want to run a marathon i don't think i could do that yet but for me sitting in a row machine and that sort of six minutes of 40 of uh, taking yourself where you don't want to go is is what i want to aim for next hey the row machine is no joke i was i wrestled in college and we were big on row machines and because of all the pull the pole yeah. and then we were big on the the assault bikes too sir are you a crossfitter or I've just more bits, like... mainly mainly rows and hitting the hitting the weights with the rugby but yeah the row is always really good for that cardio oh yeah. yeah it's good that's that's awesome yeah I, it's funny you you're making investments into your fitness i've done the same thing i actually just built out a home gym and i'm super pumped about it i love taking yourself i call it the pain cave put yourself in the pain cave <laughs> oh yeah go, go where someone else wouldn't go it's definitely a good motto when it's fitness yeah that's right. I think it plays into your career too. If you're willing to do it in your fitness and you're willing to, to do things in your career that others might not be willing to do. So it, it, discipline, discipline transcends multiple areas of life, fitness, career, leadership, everything. Matt, if folks want to reach out to you, what's the best way for them to, to find you? Uh, please connect with me on LinkedIn and uh, yeah, I try and reply to everyone. And I know I've had a few people reach out since connect, but yeah, please do. Awesome. Matt, thank you so much for coming in today and for talking about everything y'all are doing at JLR. It's super exciting and great to hear the growth that the, the platform has had within the organization. And I'm excited for, for more things to come. Thank you. Me too. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Wherever you're consuming this, if it's YouTube, if it's Apple Podcasts, Spotify, we appreciate you. Make sure you're subscribed. We have a lot more amazing guests on the way, a lot more great content. We're doing our best to bring you value and have fun while we do it. And we really want this to be a career advantage listening to this show and we want you to enjoy it. So it means a lot. Make sure you're subscribed for what's, what's to come. And also, if you're up for it, it would mean a lot if you leave us a like, a comment, a rating, a review, whatever platform you're on. That really helps and it gets us fired up when we see those. So I appreciate you guys. Find us on LinkedIn. I'm Blake Bozarth, my co-host Chad Pike with a Y. Would love to connect with you there. Have an awesome day. See you next time. Peace.